So now we are going to look at the result from the two days hackathon that has been going on here. First subsurface hackathon in Stavanger, it says. And with us we have Matt Hall. And you're definitely a geoscientist by background. You have 20 years in our industry. And you run Agile Scientific. And you've been helping in, us out on this hackathon. Agile is a great name because it's fast iterations, making progression. So you started seven, eight years ago. So you took a very good name there. Um, you run courses, hackathons, uh, events, projects, everything machine learning subsurface. And you do blogs and podcasts. And you have the Slack community, Software Underground, where I think it's more than 800 people that care about this are actively working and sharing. Thank you very much for pushing this. Um, thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, hi everyone. I'm not sure what proportion of the audience, because people who uh, weren't at the hackathon just put their hands up, so I get a rough, okay, awesome, good. Uh, I'm gonna plug in. So yeah, we've been here since, uh, I guess, Monday evening. Uh, we started getting together, uh, 50 or so people, um, who, most of whom were sort of strangers, mutual strangers, um, got together on Monday evening and we started trying to form teams and find projects and uh, things to work on. And uh, we finished up yesterday and sorry, I'm just going to have to fix up my computer here. Um, and I wanted to share a little bit of what we've been up to and what kind of came out of the uh, what some of the teams produced. And you'll get to see a couple of the teams uh, work as well. Um, and uh, I think we've got a way to show you more of that stuff later too. Um, of course, I've got all sorts of... Yeah, yeah, I missed, missed the boat on that. Uh, <laughs> Apply. <laughs> I spent half a day trying to get my computer to do um, mirrored displays by default, and now I'm being a victim of my own success. <laughs> not for the not for the last time. So, um, oh my goodness, computers are just hard, basically. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. You know what? This is brutal. Now I've got the presentation coming up on the wrong screen. I wish I could was one of those people who could talk and do things at the same time, but I'm a guy. So <laughs> Let's just do it this way. It's totally fine. I d exactly, yeah. Yeah. So, oh, uh, I'll just mention this, uh, b because I'm pr probably going to skip through a few things quite quickly. Um, that's the URL for this. So there's a few links and things in here. Uh, so, you know, write it down or, um, if, if, if you're interested in following up on those. So this was a little word cloud that we made at the end of yesterday that the participants and a few uh, visitors, actually I don't know if they contributed, made at the end of the day. Um, and I loved, you know, I, I mean, I love doing these things. Uh, you know, they're a bit of a sort of silly data science visualization, I guess. But, um, you know, with the collaboration, fun, learning uh, in the middle, uh, intense, tired people, it was, it, it's an intense experience getting together, concentrating on something for two days. Also a bit of a luxury, right? We don't often get to do that. Essentially push all work aside and for sort of 17 consecutive hours just work on one thing. Um, so that's a real pleasure and privilege to share with uh, with all these folks. But um, I love that funds in the middle. We're, I mean, uh, there's a sort of fundamental hypothesis at the centre of Agile's community work, if I can call it that, um, which is that people do their best work in that mode at play, working on things that they're passionate about, um, with people who they trust, and uh, you know, having having fun doing it, and. Uh, I recognize that we can't do all our work probably in that mode. Sometimes there's pressure, sometimes there are consequences. Um, but occasionally it's, it's 
fantastically liberating to free yourself from some of those constraints and that's one of the purposes of the hackathon so um you know what's our sort of modus operandi well i i guess at the heart of that is a conviction that this what we're doing right now uh is a completely necessary part of scientific communication but it's not enough if it's all we do right so um we've, we've got to do some other things so um you know, what, what's our method? Well, uh, I'll, I'll describe a little bit later where the hackathons came from so that you can get, get a feel for that. But um, the, the short version is that we at Agile were a bit tired of conferences and thought, let's do something different. Let's get people in, around tables in conversation during a conference session. Uh, we did that in Calgary in 2013. And... Um, it was an amazing experience. We got 50 people there talking about, you know, talking um, with each other in small groups, so uh, less sort of intimidating circumstances for a lot of people. Uh, so they could be completely honest and completely candid about their work, right? And have kind of pub conversations, if you like, about, about their stuff. And um, we unearthed the list of um, unsolved problems in subsurface geoscience, which we've sort of been hacking on ever since. And these hackathons are part of that. Uh, essentially, they're, they're our answer to what are we going to do about these unsolved problems, right? We can't just keep giving lectures about them. Uh, let's get together and actually start solving them. So um, coffee is a central part of the method. Uh, <laughs> Steve from the uh, reinforcement learning team, uh, drinking coffee yesterday. Uh, you know, like I say, many of these people were mutual strangers before this week. So um, they got together on Slack. Uh, the Panilla just mentioned the software underground. You can go if you're interested in geoscience and computers. You qualify, and uh, it's completely free. It's uh, uh, you know, it's essentially an IM like a threaded IM group, but you can have private conversations in there too. The cool thing about Slack is it's super easy to share photos, PDFs, documents, uh, and code. So this is one of the reasons why a lot of programmers use Slack. Um, so you can go sign up, softwareunderground.org, uh, if you're interested in uh, getting a lot more notifications on your mobile device. <laughs> this is, yeah, there, there are other awesome uh, outcomes from signing up too. Um, yeah, so the, uh, these are just a few sort of what I did on my summer holidays, snapshots. Um, I feel like we need a caption competition for a couple of these, but maybe that one. Uh, yeah, we had nine teams gathered here, uh, like I say, about 50 people. Um, so nine new subsurface projects. Um, I, I, I mentioned this team yesterday. I don't know why I picked on them in particular. I just noticed that... Um, uh, you know, his industry scientists from software company uh, and three operating companies, ExxonMobil, uh, Equinor, uh, California Resources. And, you know, at, and at the end of their presentation, they're like, well, our, our stuff's on GitHub. Uh, and, you know, we're sharing all the code that we've made over the last two years, uh, two days. <laughs> 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 it, yeah. It probably has actually added uh, or taken away two years from some of our lifespans. Um, <laughs> and and, and I, I, I picked on that example because, you know, sometimes uh, I industry people are accused of being too secretive or, you know, not, not collaborating enough. Um, but it's clear that if you create the conditions, create the container for people to collaborate in, you know, in good faith, um, people show up and they'll do that. You know, so maybe we've just been doing it wrong. Maybe we've been uh, accidentally preventing people from collaborating because actually that's what they want to do. So let, let's, you know, think about how we can redesign our, um, well, and not change completely, but augment the sort of gatherings that we have today as scientists with these new modalities that, that make this sort of stuff happen. Um, okay, so a quick rundown of the projects. Um, I, well, I'm not going to read them all out. Uh, I'll let you read them. You can go back, remember, to, uh, to read them too. The, the point is that they span, um, you know, geology, geophysics, even engineering, production engineering. Um, some of them may have looked at shallower sort of problems, and some of them bit off 
essentially the sort of thing that you might normally do in a research group and spend five years investigating, right? So there's a full range of, um, uh, of essentially every dimension you can think of, uh, complexity, uh, data requirements, experience requirements, coding requirements, uh, and that's been our experience. This is the 11th hackathon that I've organized, and um, right from the start, even when we only had 18 people show up, uh, we, we had that kind of, um, I'm not going to claim we've got diversity in every dimension that we'd like, but w we've had that kind of technical diversity at least. Um, and I can also tell you that every single one of these projects produced something that was super interesting and potentially really valuable as well. So uh, we're going to... Um, put them, I, I, I think Peter has spoken to most of the teams, but we were going to ask uh, at least one team member from each of the teams to be available in um, the foyer up there or the meeting room next to it, I think it's called Hafrisfjord, um, sort of after lunch, I guess, or during the lunch period, uh, you know, with sort of laptops open so that people maybe who were on other teams and didn't get around to see all the other projects or, um, or those of you who weren't here can go around and ask questions. So it's a sort of um, uh, office hours, if you like, for the teams. So uh, if the teams are able to do that, it'd be wonderful. Um, and I'm also going to call on a couple of them in a minute uh, to show you what they did. Um, I'll also just mention that, and this is also a slight uh, uh, reminder for some of the teams too that uh, the projects are documented somewhat on uh, events.agilescientific.com uh, so one thing I just wanted to say to the teams too is if your project doesn't yet have a link to a GitHub but that GitHub exists or, or GitLab or what have you then uh, please could you add it because uh, it, it, it yeah so that we can find your stuff basically um, uh, or at least if you can add a screenshot, that would also make my life easier too, uh, blogging and so on. Um, yeah, so uh, moving on, discussion, what, what's Agile up to anyway, uh, is a question that I often get. So I thought I'd give a tiny bit of background about wh where these have come from and why we do them. Um, many people came across Agile uh, or have, have come across Agile, know us as a, as a blog, basically. Started blogging as soon as I started Agile, I couldn't wait. Uh, once I was sort of what I felt like at the time released from the corporate world. I worked for ConocoPhillips in Calgary. And then uh, as soon as I started blogging, I realized that there were actually some bloggers in ConocoPhillips already who just kept their jobs and carried on blogging. So that's, that's slightly, <laughs> slightly awkward. Uh, but it was too late because I'd moved to the east coast of Canada uh, <laughs> and was working out of a boat shed. So... Um, yeah, we blog like crazy at the beginning because it's a, a really great way of um, fulfilling your purpose of helping people and being useful and interesting, uh, but without any clients. <laughs> so, so that was good. And, it, you know, eventually uh, it sort of gets you noticed. And nowadays we do uh, essentially uh, scientific computing, mostly machine learning stuff, mostly subsurface. So, uh, for example, this is... Um, uh, detection of pipelines in the shallow subsurface GPR data for like brownfield development sites for an operator um, and uh, we've this is some work we published a couple of years ago on lithology prediction on the Scotian Shelf and uh, the Atlantic margin in Canada um, you know so th this is our sort of uh, bread and butter if you like um, but as I mentioned we, we did these wacky sessions where we invited people to come and hack in with analog technology, lots of sticky notes, lots of posters, writing things, scribbling things, drawing things, and that led to the first hackathon 2013. Um, you know, right away it was an amazing experience uh, for us, and I think, I hope, for the people who came to it. Um, you know, folks like Paul Garasino and uh, Greg Partika, uh, um, Carl Schleicher came to the first one, uh, as did, you know, an undergraduate from the Colorado School of Mines who arrived all sort of, you know, sweating because he'd walked from the bus station carrying his suit holder because he had an interview sort of the next afternoon or something. Um, and, you know, 
it, it was just an amazing uh, melting pot, I guess, of scientific coding. And uh, we were addicted right away, and we've been doing at least, well, we've been doing one or two a year ever since, um, until this year, where uh, everyone's really keen on hackathons, so we've been running lots of them. Um, we also teach a course or a, v a bunch of different kind of variants on courses, and, and that's part of the same kind of mission of trying to raise the tide of uh, data and digital literacy among geoscientists, um, because, you know, we, I mean, that's, that's what we want to see in our community. We, we just believe that we as a small company uh, can operate faster and more meaningfully if we're surrounded by other people that are like us right and um that's uh that's that's so that's our mission and i don't mean like us you know like a, a bunch of geeky white guys but i mean that are committed to this culture change that we're seeing in in digital uh digital subsurface uh, science so last year was a bit of a breakout year. Uh, we did this hackathon in Paris. It sold out very quickly. We were basically inundated with people who wanted to come hack. The theme was machine learning, uh, which I think was a big part of it. Um, you know, here's a team of students from NTNU uh, and the UK uh, with a scientist from CGG working on um, an algorithm to, uh, they were trying to recognize coherent noise trains in shot gathers. Um, you know, I mean, that. There's just a thing that's never going to happen, basically, right, outside of this type of event. Uh, this was last year. Another, we also did a machine learning hackathon in Houston uh, in the fall. And again, a uh, team of students, indeed a reservoir engineer uh, and a seismic processor from Western GECO. Um, you know, I just, I just love these collaborations. So, that, you know, here's over time the number of hackers we've had at our events. Uh, 2018, uh, by probable, I mean those events haven't happened yet, but we've got um, three more public hackathons happening this year after this one. Um, I'm, I'm not including in-house hackathons here, but you know, so we're reaching hundreds of people with this, this mode of working. So I mean, in a couple of years of, of this kind of level of activity, there will be um, you know, multiple hundreds, maybe a thousand year scientists who have uh, experienced this uh, this kind of change. Now, uh, it, I, I picked up on the sort of exponential thinking uh, remarks in, in the introduction, and I, I really like that. You know, I think I think it's that's you know the power of crowds, if you like. The the, the connected graph of twenty five people um, has a quarter as many connections. Um, as the connected graph of a crowd twice that size. So every time we reach out, we, we, we have this multiplicative effect um, on the, the, the connections between us. So, and that's, that's what grows knowledge, right? That's what grows capability. Um, <laughs> maybe tells you something about me or, or about Agile <laughs> as a business uh, to, to know that I haven't actually done this calculation before to this morning. Um, basically yesterday, I reckon we produced nine prototype technologies for about the price of, so about two million NOC. Um, in, in my experience, running the event costs of roughly 500 US dollars per participant, something like that, um, including the venue and the food and, and the prizes and all that stuff. Uh, and each individual, I think, contributes roughly five thousand dollars worth of productivity. Right? That's what sort of what they're bringing uh, to the event. So, just going by what what happened this week, um, I think that's about thirty three thousand US dollars per team. Now, I, at the bottom there, I mentioned that the last prototype I worked on in a corporate environment was uh, about half a million dollars uh, and six months. Uh, sort of wait time to find out what happened, uh, but of course it took 12 months and it cost you know X more than that, and um, and the technology didn't survive that process, <laughs> right? So um, I mean I I'm not going to say any more about that, but I think that's interesting. <laughs> um, okay, so just a reminder of the projects. I wanted to uh, call. I think I'll call on uh, Lucas and Lucy. If I, if I may, to uh, share with you what they got up to. And uh, I have your presentation right here, so um, I think you can just come and...
So um, these folks were in a team that hacked on a machine learning approach to AVO that I will let them describe. Do I have to do it in precisely four minutes again? <laughs> okay. Um, so a lot of us work in, in quantitative seismic interpretation, and it's a long and complicated process. It involves petrophysicists, rock physicists, seismic people, and it can take months to do. So what we spent the last two days doing was using a machine learning approach to try and streamline that, that process and come up with a, a quick and simple way of looking for seismic anomalies um, uh, using a clustering technique. Um, it's called ASAP, Anomaly Screening by Applying Pseudo Wells, and the team that worked on it is shown there. Um, we're a diverse range of industry and one student uh, professionals um, with, with various backgrounds, and, and really that was, that was part of the fun. So this is the workflow. Uh, the idea was to start with some input well data and some seismic data that we want to analyze. Um, from the well data, we generate a, a suite of pseudo wells using rock physics models and then a suite of synthetic seismic data. And for both the synthetic data and the real data, uh, we apply an unsupervised seismic clustering. Um, and then we, by comparing the two results, uh, we can very quickly start to look for anomalies and areas of interest within that seismic data. Um, the, the benefits of this are, are that it allows on-the-fly integration of geological knowledge during the quantitative analysis. So very quickly, you start seeing geology in the data. You don't have to wait for geophysicists and petrophysicists to do lots of stuff. Um, we use all the information in the seismic trace, so the full waveform, as opposed to extracting fluid factors or amplitudes or intercepts and gradients. Um, and the other thing this allows, particularly the pseudo-well component, is an intuitive understanding of the machine learning space. Machine learning spaces can be a bit esoteric, so this allows us, to, uh, to, to as geologists and geoscientists, to get into that world. Um, we started with some data from the Glitner field. This is a, an open source data set consisting of well data and pre-stack seismic data. Um, we used some rock physics models to, um, based on the well data, vary three parameters, oil saturation, porosity, and thickness, to generate a total of 240 um, pseudo wells. Um, and from these, we ultimately ended up using 80. And with that, oh yes, yeah, so then from that we generated some synthetic seismic data, uh, which is seen here. So we've got a, we used a 30 hertz ricker, um, and the, the picture on the right is just the complete synthetic seismic data set from, from the, 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 the um, pseudo wells that we generated. Um, and with that, I'll hand over to Lucas, who's going to talk about the, the clustering. Okay, thank you, Lucy. Uh, so, in this work, as Lucy mentioned, we wanted to gain some insights into these seismic traces that we have in our near and offset uh, stacks. And the way that we did that was we wanted to reduce the dimensionality of the tr individual traces and then see what the emerging patterns are in the raw data. So we tried a number of approaches, including uh, TSNE and UMAP, which are commonly used uh, dimensionality reduction techniques. Uh, but we ended up using what's called a variational autoencoder, which is a technique from deep learning. And essentially, the, the basic principle behind it is that we have two input traces of our real data, uh, the near and the far uh, offset. And we have a convolutional neural network that tries to map that to a much lower dimensional uh, space. So in this case, we'll map it to a 2D plane so that we can actually inspect it uh, visually and see what the patterns are. And then we want to take each of these points and the a second neural network actually reconstructs the original uh, input signal. So you have a, a sort of denoising uh, factor coming in there as well as you try to reconstruct the signal. So what we're going to do is actually map all our traces to this two-dimensional plane and see what possibly these features actually mean. But the way we do that is we actually can use some of our prior knowledge that we have of this field uh, to, to estimate what these uh, dimensions in this uh, meta space of this uh, model actually uh, corresponds to. So what you see here is on the right side, we took uh, around one of the wells where we know that we produced some oil or that we found some oil. We took those traces and mapped them back into this two-dimensional plane and you see them highlighted in red. So what we found from this is that probably the left side of this graph where we show here the hydrocarbon fluids probably corresponds to a region of the traces that show some kind of uh, oil or uh, hydrocarbon uh, category. 
And so we divided this uh, two-dimensional plane into two sectors, this left one and the right one will have to figure out what that actually means and what these uh, clusters correspond to. The way we did that was that we built uh, a number of, I believe it was 250 pseudo wells uh, with varying amounts of water saturation, porosity and thickness. And then we looked at what these uh, pseudo wells, how they map in this uh, two dimensional plane. So what we find is that we can actually uh, correlate uh, the porosity and water saturation uh, with some of the lithologies that have been found in this field where the upper parts probably correspond to uh, stiffer sands and the lower parts uh, can be classified as uh, non-reservoir regions in our reservoir. Now since we have this uh, mapping between our traces and these categories, we can now actually use this geological knowledge that we brought in to map back this into a 2D plane view. So we're looking at, the, at a 2D cross-section through our reservoir where we now have uh, these categories per trace. And what we find is that um, the, the stiff sands actually correspond nicely with the lithologies that have been found in the reservoir where we think we, we find these uh, stiffer sands. But also you can see the hydrocarbon fluids map nicely with the actual structure that is shown with the contour lines. So you have a, a, a closure or a, a higher plateau there uh, where we also find these hydrocarbon fluids around that well which is shown in red. So we were really able to integrate all the geological knowledge coming from the pseudo wells combined with this unsupervised clustering technique and gain some additional information uh, on the distribution of our facies within our reservoir. So with that, um, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much to Lucy and Lucas. Um, if you've got questions for them, then I urge you to find them uh, afterwards. And, you know, just as a reminder, that team didn't exist on Monday. None of that code existed on Monday. That idea didn't exist on Monday. You know, it's, it's, it's pretty cool. Uh, so with that, um, would, uh, you're okay to come up? Um, so I'd like to invite all the team from, uh, I guess, 300 wells uh, to come and describe how they looked at some unstructured data and extracted some intelligence from it. So let's try that. It's the first time I'm using my laptop for a presentation, so, well. <laughs> so I must say that our presentation is a little bit less fancy than the first one. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> uh, let me see. So as uh, Matt mentioned, uh, our team is uh, also very diverse. You can see that we are from different companies. And um, I can say that actually we are all data scientists, but at very various levels. So my level, I'm an estope. I can say I'm just a student. And all my uh, teammates, which uh, who were Jesse and Carter and Florio and Chris, they were very extremely good in coding. So I learned a lot. It was really great for me, but I don't know if for them it was as great for me to have me in the team, if you see what I mean. But anyway, so that was really cool. And uh, I have to say something about the initial idea, which was to extract oil show information from PDF reports. So we had actually over 300 PDF reports and um, they were somewhere several hundred pages. Well, everybody, I guess, here is familiar with well reports, how exciting it is to read well reports. So I can imagine that uh, Mr. Borman um, from ConocoPhillips, who came with the original idea, he actually thought, well, I'm not going to read all that, so let's organize a hackathon and find some dudes to just <laughs> figure out. Thank you. <laughs> so, well, that was a good idea. So um, it was very interesting. 
So as I mentioned, we had a lot of PDF files, al almost 400 actually, and we were interested to locate which of these well reports had oil shows. So oil shows is not only the word or phrase oil show, but it can be a color, an odor, another mention of words which are indicating oil shows. So that was the first difficulty, that was not so straightforward. And then also we would like, we wanted to uh, get quality indicator for these oil shows. Are they good oil shows or middle of the road or mediocre or no oil shows? So that's where it got really tricky. And here you can see that uh, it's an extract of two pages. It's typical, it's skewed as, as you, you, don't, you really don't want to read that, come on. So you have to find another way to, to go through this. So the pipeline is going to be described after the next slide. So don't get too impatient. Because the next slide is the, actually the front end result and uh, Florian Bassier, is, he left. <laughs> he went back to Houston. So he was uh, our front end uh, developer and he managed in uh, such a short time to develop a quite nice interface with, I'm sorry, I'm not going to be finished. <laughs> so, and the interface is to be able to see the oil show conf uh, confidence uh, by colors around the well. So here you see only a few wells. It's uh, like really like a, a beta version. And then by clicking on the well on the right side, you see actually where the oil shows are. It's in MD. And the color indicates the, vari the, the different um, quality of the oil show. And you can, by scrolling, also see where in the text the oil show was in the PDF. So that's the idea. I think, I hope it's clear enough. Yes, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so next slide is, um, the pipeline, Ta <laughs> Okay, so uh, most of this job is pre-processing. Um, so the, uh, the PDFs had already been OCR'd. Uh, dumped the PDFs to uh, text. Um, we also had an industry taxonomy consisting of about 360 unique terms combine those into about 45 million unique trigrams, and that's the basis for our labels, because it's not as simple as just searching for the phrase good shows. And then uh, you take the, uh, the corpus for all of those documents and munge those into trigrams, and then search for proximity in terms of word distance to depth, right? And that becomes the pair, and it's that pair of information that we wanted to apply confidence to. Uh, for the NN stuff, Chris? Right, and in order to receive the information out of the context of each of those trigrams, we had figured that um, by creating trigrams out of every single three-word pairing through uh, all of these documents, we could find those that are most impactful, and we wanted to train a neural net to be able to figure that out for us. And so we compared, um, we, we created all these different combina combinatoric words of uh, of trigrams associated with positive oil shows, and scored those on all the rest of the, the um, all the, the trigrams possible, and it's still scoring right now because of the immense size of the of the data in there. Um, but once we do put that through the neural net, we'll run it through a neural net regression, at, or yeah, a neural net regression uh, with a softmax output uh, to give us a probability of a match for an oil show. And that would be returned into this document where we can filter it down to only the positive shows. So it certainly makes uh, a little bit lighter work of the task of reading through a series of 400 well reports that would take anybody weeks, months, or even longer. Uh, Wells team. Um, I'll just uh, leave you with a reminder of the, uh, the project so you can decide who you want to go chat to first. Um, like I mentioned before, there is uh, all sorts of wacky stuff there, turning geological sketches into seismic data, for example, or using the technology that um, 
solved the Atari problem that I think we're all we're all worried about um, <laughs> using reinforcement learning to pick stratigraphic traps. Uh, what else is in there? Grain size and lithology from core photos. That was really cool. Uh, two projects on 4D um, data. Uh, predicting geological ages from species counts. Uh, uh, palynological data. And what have I missed out? I don't think I've missed anything out. That ba basically covers it. What? The, the, yeah, yeah, the geological sort of uh, sketches into seismic. Um, so... Uh, something for everybody, I think. Uh, go and uh, interrogate the authors and uh, have a look at some of the cool visualizations they made. Um, think about trying a hackathon or organize one yourself. Uh, they're, you know, they're a lot of fun to do. And that's all I had to say, so thanks for your attention.